Okay. Now, the Alamo garrison is dead. They're gone. Fannin and his men, they're gone. The only hope left for Texas is at Gonzales. Sam Houston and the 500 or so men which are starting together with him, they're the last hope. They've got to somehow stop Santa Ana and Araya's armies from marching through Texas. And when people hear about these disasters, they start fleeing. And Sam Houston himself, he is going to also flee. He is going to retreat. Because he knows he's not ready yet to fight the big battle that he perceives being needed to win this revolution. So let's learn a little bit about this guy, the guy who's going to lead the Texas Army eventually to victory. Sam Houston was born in 1793. And he will not die until 1863. Sadly, if you notice the date there, 1863 is in the middle of some big historical event. Do you know what it is? Yes, the Civil War. Uh, we'll learn about this later, but Sam Houston, after he becomes a big hero and helps us win our independence, he will hold high office in Texas for many, many years. And when the Civil War broke out, he was the governor of the state of Texas. And he thought it was a bad idea to secede from the Union to join the Confederacy. He was against it. And we'll talk about it. He warned against it. And so he had to resign. He resigned as governor, stepped down, went into private life because he wasn't going to fight for the Confederacy. And uh, he died during the Civil War with most Texans looking at him as a traitor and being mad at him because he didn't support the South. And what's even worse, he lived long enough to have seen his son go off and fight for the Confederacy and be killed. So he actually dies kind of sad. Uh, but he will have a long, successful life and do a lot of great things before we get to that very sad end. Um, he did have two different names that he went by, <laughs> for better or worse, both of which were given to him by the Cherokees. One was the Raven, the other was Big Drum. Before the Revolution, he will end up being the governor of Tennessee and an experienced military officer. So let me tell you a little bit about Sam Houston's background. Sam Houston has some similarities with Davy Crockett. He grew up on the frontier in Tennessee. When he was a kid, he ran away from home at a very young age. Um, didn't like working around the farm, didn't like the way he was being treated, and he wanted to go off and wreck and have a little bit of adventure. So he fled home, ran across the river to where a group of Indians lived. By this time, the Cherokee Indians, which we've talked about before, had already been pushed off their original tribal lands, pushed further west, and many of the Cherokee were living in uh, Tennessee. And so he starts living with the Cherokee as a kid, teenager, like y'all. And he spends several years living with the Cherokee. Now what he ends up doing is eventually he comes back to his family. And he spends the next several years of his teenage years living with Cherokee, then going back and staying with his family a little, and then going back to the Cherokee. And with the Cherokee, uh, Chief Ulukeha was... Uh, chief of this group that he was staying with, and he kind of adopted Sam Houston, kind of took him in as his son, and he considered Ulukeka his uh, Indian father, and he was given an Indian name, a Cherokee name, Colonel the Raven. That's a good name. It sounds like, you know, a very noble bird, strong bird, sounds really good, it's a nice name, it's a good name. Uh, name to go by. So he'll go by that name among the Cherokee. 
Well, eventually, uh, as he's splitting time between being with the Cherokees and being with his own family, eventually he grows up. Eventually, he decides to start trying to kind of build a life for himself. And then the War of 1812 broke out. And so he joined the United States Army to fight. Now, the big fight down south wasn't with the British initially. It was with the Creek Indians who were on the warpath and had slaughtered about 500 settlers at a place called Fort Mills. And so General Andrew Jackson was sent down south to gather an army and to go stop the Indian uprising, the Red Stick Confederacy, as it was called. So he joined the army, and he worked his way up from joining as a private, eventually getting appointed an officer and becoming a lieutenant, low-ranking officer, but one that will lead men in battle. And the battle that's going to be fought is called the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. The way that battle takes place is the Tappaloosa River flows something like this. It makes a horseshoe. It's open on one end. The native uh, tribes, the Creek Indians that were the enemy that they were out after, they had set up their camp in the bend of the river. So they're protected on all sides except this one. And they had built a breastworks. They had built a defensive wall along that area to defend. So for the U.S. Army attacking this position, they're going to have to charge towards the def defended wall where the Creek Indians have guns and arrows and they're shooting at them. And so when the battle begins, young Sam Houston leading troops is part of that group running towards that wall, trying to break through. He and his men charge the wall. They get to the wall. They start fighting their way over the wall. And as he fights his way over the wall, he gets wounded several times. He gets shot in the shoulder. He gets shot in the other arm. And he takes an arrow in the thigh. He has somebody rip the arrow out of his leg. And bleeding from three extremely serious wounds, he just keeps on fighting. And he fights until he passes out from loss of blood. What ends up happening is they do break through. They make it into the camp. And they slaughter the Creek Indians. Jackson wanted victory, crushed the Indian uprising, and was a big hero. But now Jackson had to deal with the British, who were getting ready to invade New Orleans. But before they left New Orleans to prepare for their next fight, uh, young Sam Houston is now hospitalized, bedridden. He's been wounded in battle, and quite frankly, it looks like he's going to die. He's lost a bunch of blood. So uh, Jackson actually goes in and talks to the young fella who he had heard so much about this guy's bravery. Jackson could respect how brave this guy was the way he had fought so well in battle. And he thinks it's kind of sad this poor guy's going to be sent home to his mommy to die. But he sends him on home to Tennessee, and Jackson goes on, leads the army, whips the British, defeats them in the Battle of New York Orleans, and becomes a national hero. Now Jackson's also from Tennessee, and when he comes back to Tennessee, this young fella, Houston, didn't die. And he really liked Houston, and Houston really admired him. And he kind of takes Houston in like a son, like a protege. He's going to help Sam Houston move along in life. He's going to help him get promotions, get jobs. He'll be appointed, uh, he'll be put, in, he'll get a promotion in the military. He'll be put in charge of relations with uh, the Cherokee Indians. He'll be an agent for the U.S. government. Eventually, he will go into private practice, and he will become a lawyer and make money that way. Eventually, he's going to be interested in politics, and he will get elected, eventually working his way up to be the general of all militia units in Tennessee. He's the head of the Tennessee militia. And his good friend, his sponsor, Andrew Jackson, 
was so popular, he went on to become President of the United States of America. Now, if you're best buddies with the President of the United States of America, there's going to be a lot of benefits to that. And Houston's already enjoyed a lot of those benefits being promoted, and now Houston is ready to run for governor of the state of Tennessee. And with the President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, a very popular man from Tennessee, saying, vote for my buddy Sam Houston, Houston becomes governor of Tennessee. He's 34 years old. He is best friends with the President of the United States. He is the governor of the state of Tennessee. He has got a bright future in front of him. Heck, someday he'll probably be the president. He's set up. At this point, he makes a big mistake. He finally decides it's time to get married. And he marries a beautiful man. He's 34 years old at this time. He's 35. But he marries a beautiful, young, 19-year-old Southern Belle, Eliza Allen. She's from a wealthy family, good, well-off family in Tennessee, great person to marry, and the family's thrilled to have their daughter marry a guy who's so well-off and is heading places. Oh, yeah, they knew his age. That wasn't really that weird. For an adult man who's finally established himself in life and has a bright future, to marry a 19-year-old girl wasn't that, I mean, it is a bit of an age difference there, but it wasn't unusual. But unfortunately, the marriage didn't work. And why? Well, we still don't fully quite know. They got married, and about 11 weeks later, she left him. Now, here's the thing. It could have been the age difference. It could have been that uh, she actually was in love with some young guy, as it appears may have been the case, that she wanted to marry, but her family pressured him into marrying this guy. It could have been he was just so old and battle-scarred and gross that she wasn't in love with a guy that looked like him. Maybe. We don't really know what the problem was. All we know is they gave up the marriage. Now, here's the deal. Today, if that happened, it might hurt you a little bit to get Back then, was divorce an acceptable thing? Absolutely not. It was scandalous. It was unacceptable. He is the leader of the state of Tennessee. And he and his wife are splitting up. That was scandalous. You can't have somebody who does something so immoral as divorce be a leader. That's the way society looked at it at the time. But the thing was, he had a lot of friends. A lot of people liked him, and they didn't want to blame him. So who do you blame? It's obviously the girl. She's the problem. And some people started saying it. And some people even started putting it in print because the press is covering this. And when people started to say bad things about this young lady, Sam Houston basically let it be known. The next one of you guys who says something ugly about this young woman, I'll kill you. He ain't the kind of guy that you'd want to test on a threat like that. So they stopped saying bad things about her. They got to blame it on somebody. So now the blame is all put on him. You can't have a governor who does something as immoral as get a divorce. So his political reputation is ruined. His life is ruined. The guy, two months before, was on his way to someday being president. He was popular. He was in charge. Life was great. And he was marrying a pretty young girl. And now it's all ruined. Where are you going to go after your life's been ruined like this? Where would he go? Eventually, if you're someplace first. Yeah, at some point we got to have to find out where Chuck's going to go. And then Taylor will write another good song. Um, where had he gone before when he wanted to get away from it all? Indians. Indians. Sam Houston leaves America. And he goes out west and rejoins his friends at the Cherokee. Now, he is depressed at this point. In fact, there's one report about him as he's traveling west to go join the Cherokee where he had to take a steamboat across the river, and it didn't go well. He was drunk when he arrived at the boat. He was drunk and disorderly on the boat, 
He was such a problem that they had to jump him and tie him up until they got to the other side of the river to keep him under control. He arrives at the Cherokee camp, drunk. And he basically spends the next couple of years drunk. And this is why the Indians rename him Big Drunk. Because he spends a lot of time drunk. Because his life's ruined. But slowly he starts to recover. Slowly he starts to get it back together. And eventually by the time he gets it back together, well, the Cherokees got another big problem. Because the Cherokees, once again, are going to get booted off their land. Because what always happens, the Indians are being pushed further and further west. And so he steps up, living with his friends, the Cherokee. He still has connections. He still has friends in Washington. And he still has connections with the president. And so he heads to Washington. He heads back east, and he acts as an ambassador for the Indians. He deals with the government. Eventually, that leads him to Washington, D.C., where he gets in a dispute with a congressman over an Indian uh, a contract between the government and the Indians. And uh, things did not go well in their discussion, so he walloped the guy with his walking stick. And uh, so he got brought up on charges of assault and brought in front of the United States Congress to answer these charges and for assaulting a congressman. And after... Uh, a fairly lengthy and public trial in which Houston was able to get up and speak and speak out in favor of the Indians and talk about the way the Indians had been mistreated. He finally is found innocent. He's recovered himself. He has become, once again, he's got a life. He's got a purpose. But the problem is, now that he's woke up and he wants to have a life, if you're sticking up for the Indians, do you really have much of a future in American politics? Are you going to get voted in by most Americans? Unfortunately, no. But there is a place he can go to restart his political career, and that is time to go to Texas. Sam Houston heads to Texas. And exactly what he thought he was going to do when he got here, eh, we're not quite sure. He might have already had his idea that there would eventually be a revolution and he'll lead it. He might have just had the idea that it's a good place to start, make a fortune, establish myself. Whether he came with the intent of being part of a revolution, it at least was on his mind that it would happen. And he got here to Texas, he established a law practice, he got involved right in the middle of all the politics of when the fighting began because he had been a military man and led the Tennessee militia, he'll be voted in to be the commander of our army. So, during the revolution, he's the commander of the Texas army. And after the revolution, being a big war hero, he'll be elected president of the Republic of Texas, twice. And then we'll become a state in the union. He'll be elected governor of the state of Texas. And when he's not busy serving as governor of Texas, we'll elect him a senator and send him to Washington to represent us. So he'll spend most of the rest of his life and public life leading Texas. Now, Sam Houston's going to be a very popular guy. There's a lot of guys, a lot of Texans that loved Sam Houston and respected him greatly, followed his leadership. But being a leader, not everyone's going to agree with his leadership. There will be those in Texas that hate Sam Houston because he has different political views and opinions than they do, and they want to go a different direction. So he'll have his political enemies. There will be those that don't like Sam Houston. But Sam Houston will continue to lead Texas for a very long time. All right, so now Sam Houston's in charge. And we've talked about this before. When he arrived at Gonzales, after he was at Washington on the Brazos, he heard the Alamo was under attack. He told them to stay there, to form a government. And he went to Gonzales to raise an army. When he arrived, he got news the Alamo had fallen. So he stays for several days. He stays until March 13th, gathering troops. 
but he knows he's not going to have enough troops to march on Santa Ana in San Antonio. Santa Ana has, in San Antonio, somewhere between three to 5,000 troops in San Antonio or on its way there. South of him, General Arreo with about 1,000 men is marching through South Texas. He knows he doesn't have the strength to make the attack just yet. Houston decides he needs to retreat east and gather more men. Plus, as he goes east and gets more men, what happens to Santa Ana's army? Does it get stronger? Is Santa Ana going to get any more men going east? No. What's he going to have to leave behind him everywhere he captures stuff? He's going to have to leave men at San Antonio and at other places behind him. He's going to ha have to stretch his supply lines out. Remember, he wants to keep connected to Mexico. And the further east he goes, the further he is from Mexico. He's being spread out. The Mexican army will get weaker as they go east. The Texas armies will get stronger. Mm -hmm. So that's his plan. Retreat until he's strong enough to turn and have a chance now, even if he grows his army quite a bit, he's probably not going to be able to raise as big an army as Santa Ana has. So he's got to look for the right moment and time to make his attack where he has a chance to win. He has to be careful because one fight, if he loses, is there anybody else left? He's the last hope. So this is why he's going to order his men to retreat. But there's a problem. Sam Houston... When he commands troops, he's a military man, and he expects people to do what he says. Without question, he's the general. But y'all know the Texans. We've already talked about this. Are these a military people that are used to military order and regulation? No. no they're fighters. They ain't military men. And they need to be told why they're doing what they're doing. They don't just follow orders blindly. And is Sam Houston the kind of guy who's going to stop and explain himself? No, he's not. So when he gives orders and expects the Texans to follow him, the Texans will grumble and they'll complain. And they'll say, what a big coward. He's retreating. We should go fight. we got to go get revenge. A lot of these Texans aren't doing a lot of math and thinking about the odds. They're just saying, we got to go to San Antonio and fight. And he tells them, no, pack your stuff. We're heading east. We're fleeing. They don't want to run away, even though it's the right thing to do. So, they burn the town of Gonzales on the 13th of March, and they began retreating east. They burned it so there would be nothing left behind for the Mexican army. Because as the Mexican army advances, the Mexicans are going to be foraging. They're going to be looking for food and supplies, and we don't want to leave them anything that they could use. So they burn Gonzales to the ground, and they begin retreating. Now, if you look at the map of Texas, geographically, what do you have a lot of between, uh, huh? Well, there's trees. That's one thing. Get the woodlands at my rivers more. If there's some other geographic feature that's going to be in the way, water. There's a lot of rivers. A lot of rivers. They're not all huge rivers, but they're hard to cross for an army trying to bring wagons and cannons and equipment across a river. And especially... The Brazos will be tough, the Colorado will be tough, and it's March, and there was a lot of rain that year, and the rivers got deep and swift. The rivers were hard to cross. So as Sam used to retreat, first of all, he's going to have to cross the Guadalupe, he's going to have to cross the, um, what did I put my down? Cross Guadalupe, he's going to cross... Colorado River. And once he got to the other side of the Colorado River, Santa Ana was now pursuing. Now, Santa Ana has a plan. First of all, he destroyed the garrison at the Alamo. And Area has wiped out the garrison at Goliath. And the army that's fleeing from him, it's not really that big. Santa Ana basically feels like he's just going to march through Texas and the people that aren't loyal to Mexico, the people who are troublemakers, the people who are enemies, are going to flee back to the U.S. He would like to catch them. He would love to catch up with Sam Houston, fight a battle, and 
crush the Texas Army and get more glory. Or, if he can't catch them, he'd love to catch those guys at Washington on the Brazos that claim they're the new government of Texas. And if he catches them, what is he going to do? He's going to execute those guys. That'll look good. He would love to do that. So Santa, Santa Ana has made this plan. What he's going to do, he's got Areo marching up the coast with roughly 1,000 men. He's going to send right through the middle of Texas, General Sessma and the cavalry, and about 1,000 men. He's going to follow in that column with his troops in the middle. And then to the north, he's going to send, I believe it was General Guyona, I could be wrong, but I think it was Guyona that had about 1,000 men that marched to the north. And they spread into three columns, and they marched through Texas. Here's the thing, he divided his army up. But each of these columns has more than 1,000 men. Are any of these columns weak enough that they should be threatened by the Texas army? No. He's got all three columns are big and strong enough they should be able to protect themselves and fight anything they run into. So this is not a bad military move. He's trying to sweep through Texas and chase people out. And as he marches through Texas, what do the Texans do? Run. When they see that Sam Houston's army is retreating and going that way, they follow. They're not staying around to get caught. And it's embarrassing. The whole runaway scrape is kind of an embarrassing moment in Texas history because we turned tail and we ran fast. The Mexican army, when they arrived at people's homes, they often found the chickens in the yard, the cattle in the field, breakfast still on the table from several days ago where somebody rode up to the farm and told the people, Sam Houston's retreating, Santa Ana's coming, and they got so scared they didn't even finish breakfast, they grabbed what they could, and they took off a running that fast. The people of Texas are fleeing, and as they flee, Sam Houston's army marches and retreat with them. The good news is, as he retreats, Sam Houston will get more volunteers. By the time he makes it to the Colorado River, Sam Houston had right around a thousand men. When Cessna and his cavalry arrive on the other side of the Colorado River, they had a little bit over a thousand men. And at that point, a thousand Texans versus oh, a little bit more than a thousand Mexicans, are the odds almost even there? Kind of. There was a river between them, and it had been raining heavily. And for, so for several days, actually, Houston and his army rested on the side of the river they had made it to. And the Mexican army was just on the other side of the river. And a lot of the Texans said, this is it. This is our chance. This is a small enough group. We can beat them. Let's do it. Let's cross the river. Let's fight. And Houston considered it. In the end, Houston ordered them to turn tail, break camp, and march further east and retreat north. And how did the Texans feel about that? Yeah. They thought, ah, the coward. It's time to fight. The thing is, if they had crossed that river, and let's say they get across the river without being uh, attacked, which would be hard to do, but let's say they get on the other side of the river where the Mexican army is, and they fight the Mexican army, and let's say they win. Let's say they crush the Mexican army on the other side of the river. Is the revolution <laughs> won? No. no, because what do they still have to do? Yeah, they crushed this group. There's still more Mexican soldiers all over the place that they got to defeat. They won't gain much except feeling good that they won a victory. But if they cross the river and they get defeated there, it's over. Sam Houston made the right choice. This is not the place and time to fight. The odds aren't good enough. <coughs> what we could gain doesn't match what we could lose. But the Texas soldiers, they're mad. They don't like retreating. And so they keep retreating. And the Mexicans keep chasing them. Several things happen on the march. The Texans cross the Colorado. They eventually cross the Brazos River. And they eventually make it all the way north to Jared Gross's plantation. Do y'all remember him? He was the richest guy in Texas. He had a plantation with more than 100 slaves. He was well off. And when the Texas Army arrived 
at his plantation. They used his plantation house as a hospital for their wounded and their sick that were wore, wore out from that long march. And they camped on his land, and they ate his food, and they tore down his fences and cut down his trees for firewood. They wrecked the place. But if you're him, are you willing to let them? Yeah, because they are who's going to try to save you and save all that you own here in Texas. They're going to try to win this war. So he lets them stay, and they use it as a base. And for a number of days, the Texas Army camps out there off the chart. The Mexican Army has nowhere, no idea where they've gotten off to, so they're safe for the moment. They've got to rest, and they rest, and they recover. And they spend those days with Sam Houston getting out there trying to teach these Texans how to line up, how to march, how to maneuver, how to fight like a real army. Because if they square off one of these Mexican armies, is the Mexican army going to know how to maneuver and march? Yeah, they are. If you're going to fight them in a real battle, you better know how to be soldiers. Sam Houston is trying to teach his men how to do the job. Meanwhile, Santa Ana's chasing them. 